Hi everybody, I'm Chris Morosky. The title of this video is Third Trimester Bleeding, and it is part of our Basic Science Conference video series. The goals and objectives of this video are as follows. Discuss the workup and management of a patient presenting with placenta previa. Review prenatal carrier screening options. Discuss venous stasis in pregnancy, and describe in detail the basic science pathophysiology of placenta accreta, increta, and percreta. In this video, we will follow our patient, DD. DD is a 32-year-old Caucasian G3P2002 who presents for a routine follow-up prenatal visit at 24 weeks and 5 days. Her main complaint is vaginal bleeding after intercourse. What are the routine parts of her prenatal care that you would want to review in her chart prior to seeing her today? What specific follow-up questions do you have about her vaginal bleeding and her previous pregnancies? In this video, we are going to cover a part of routine prenatal care called carrier screening. Individuals can be carriers or heterozygote for serious medical conditions and express no manifestations of the disease. A child affected by the disease can be born to couples who are both heterozygotic carriers for the disease. Carrier screening was designed to identify heterozygotic individuals and then test their partners so as to provide an assessment of the risk of having a child born and being affected by the disease. Carrier screening was traditionally done when women became pregnant and based on ethnicity. Traditional carrier screening was often based on ethnicity. For example, with patients of African descent, they would be offered a hemoglobin electrophoresis to screen for sickle cell disease. For patients of Mediterranean or Southeast Asian descent, they would be offered hemoglobin electrophoresis to screen for thalassemias. Caucasian patients were offered cystic fibrosis testing. Ashkenazi Jewish patients were offered multiple screening, including Tay-Sachs, Canavan's disease, and familial dysautonomia, to name a few. The downside to ethnic-based carrier screening is that there is some risk that any individual can be a carrier for any disease. Also, with modern DNA-based technologies, it is possible to screen for multiple genetic conditions very efficiently and cheaply. With current carrier screening, women and their partners can be screened during or even before pregnancy. This allows for certain technologies such as in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetics to be performed so that embryos that aren't affected by the disease can be transferred. With this, patients don't have to make the decision about pregnancy termination based on their conception having a genetic disease. Also, with expanded carrier screening, hundreds of gene mutations can be sequenced and identified. The risks and benefits of this need to be discussed at length with patients. If you test enough genes, almost every individual will be found to be a carrier for many rare diseases. Knowing about the presence of these gene mutations in individuals can cause anxiety, even though there is very minimal risk to their own personal health or to their offspring. For this reason, it is extremely important to use a genetic counselor in the pretest and post-test counseling of these individuals. Two important things to know about in terms of carrier screening is that hemoglobinopathy screening cannot be performed using carrier screening, but rather should be performed using hemoglobin electrophoresis. And the other is Tay-Sachs screening in non-Ashkenazi Jewish patients. This condition is very rare outside of this population, and therefore, hexosaminidase A enzyme screening should be offered. All right, returning from prenatal carrier screening to our patient DD, what are the routine parts for prenatal care that you would want to review in her chart prior to seeing her today? And what specific follow-up questions do you have about her vaginal bleeding in her previous pregnancies? The specific questions that you would want to ask her about her vaginal bleeding in previous pregnancies include the following. You would want to obtain a limited history with a focus on obstetrical and gynecologic histories. You'd want to ask a sexual history. And then you'd want to quantify her vaginal bleeding, ask if she has any associated pain, cramps, or contractions, ask if she has any leakage of fluid from the vagina, and question her about fetal movement. These last four questions are the pregnancy review of systems that you should ask every pregnant patient at every single encounter. Alright, let's see what we learn of our partner positives for our patient DD. On further HPI and review of systems, the intercourse was consensual and it was normal penis in the vagina intercourse. She has no cramping or pain. She reports that the bleeding is about the same as a heavy period. It lasted for one day, then stopped. Now she is having brown discharge. There was no clotting. 
She endorses positive fetal movement and denies contractions or leakage of fluid from the vagina. Her prenatal course so far has been uncomplicated. She had normal initial labs and she declined a pap smear. She also declined first and second trimester ultrasound and genetic screening. She did have an AFP performed and that was normal. In her history, she has two prior cesarean deliveries. The first was for arrest of dilation and the second was an elective repeat. She has eczema and no other surgeries. She's a never smoker and she works in marketing. What part of the physical exam would you want to perform today? The physical exam that you'd want to perform on the patient includes the following. Vital signs and general appearance, urine dipstick, fetal heart tones and fundal height, abdominal exam, pelvic exam to include inspection of the external genitalia and a gentle speculum exam. A bimanual and rectal vaginal exam would be avoided prior to performing an ultrasound. Here are the physical exam findings for our patient DD. On physical exam, her vital signs. She is 5 feet 4 inches tall and 137 pounds. Her blood pressure is 118 over 68. Her heart rate 71, respiratory rate 18, her temperature is 99.0 degrees Fahrenheit. On general appearance, she is alert and oriented no apparent distress. Her abdomen is gravid, soft and non-tender. The fundal height is 25 centimeters. The fetal heart tones are 154 beats per minute. On pelvic exam, she has bilateral, small, non-bleeding vulvar varicosities on the labia majora, a normal vagina and closed cervix and speculum exam. There is a small amount of old brown blood in the vagina. Digital cervical exam is deferred. She has no hemorrhoids. A rectal exam is also deferred. Now you're going to spend the money. What additional testing would you want to order? Prior to reviewing any testing, in this slide I wanted to briefly review some of the manifestations of venous stasis in pregnancy. Due to the vascular changes caused by increasing progesterone in pregnancy, as well as the enlarging uterus compressing the vena cava, it is very common to see venous stasis changes in pregnancy. Here on the slide you can see these clinical manifestations. On the top left corner can be seen vulvar varicosities, similar to the vulvar varicosities that our patient DD has on exam. To the right are increased abdominal veins, which are quite common at the end of pregnancy. On the bottom right represents hemorrhoids, and on the lower left are lower extremity varicosities. All of these are common clinical findings associated with venous stasis of pregnancy. It is not uncommon for patients to have minor manifestations of venous stasis in pregnancy in their first pregnancy with almost complete resolution. With future pregnancies, these manifestations can become more prominent and can become chronic conditions. All right, moving on to our additional testing. Since our patient is presenting with third trimester bleeding, it's going to be very important to order a second and third trimester ultrasound. For details of biometry and amniotic fluid index, please see our preeclampsia video. Importantly, for this patient, the placental location is going to be the number one thing that we're going to want to look for on our ultrasound. Since she has had a moderate amount of bleeding, a complete blood count would be indicated at this time. Most likely, this patient is going to be admitted to the hospital, and an active type and screen is going to be important for her, especially because there is some probability of acute hemorrhage and need for transfusion. All right, let's see what are the results of our further workup. On transabdominal ultrasound, our patient is found to have a viable singleton intrudent pregnancy in the breech presentation. The fetal heart tones are 147 beats per minute. She has a grade 1 anterior placenta and a complete previa. The growth measurements eventually reveal that her adjusted ultrasound age is 23 weeks and 3 days, which is at the 23rd percentile. Her amniotic fluid index is 12.1 centimeters. Her blood work reveals that she has an A-negative blood type with a negative antibody screen. Her hemoglobin is 12.2 and her hematocrit is 36.1. Putting this all together, she has a normally grown fetus with normal amniotic fluid. She has an A-negative blood type and will need rogam. Most importantly, she has a complete previa noted on her transabdominal ultrasound. Next, we will go over the basic science concepts explaining the pathophysiology of placenta accreta spectrum. The question that you will be asked is diagram the role that cytoencystitial trophoblasts play in placenta accreta, remembering Nidabug's layer. In this first slide, we are observing the normal menstrual endometrium. The endometrium is broken up into two layers, the endometrium functionalis and the endometrium basalis. Penetrating through the underlying myometrium from the uterine artery are the spiral arteries. During menstruation, the endometrium functionalis is sloughed off and shed 
while the endometrium basalis is left behind to regenerate the overlying endometrium. Moving on to the next slide, we can see that in pregnancy, the endometrium is called the decidua. This is in response to the increasing levels of progesterone seen with pregnancy. In this slide, the blood vessels are removed to simplify things. The pregnancy decidua is broken up similarly to the menstrual endometrium. The decidua has two parts, the decidua compacta on top and the decidua spongiosum underneath. In between these two layers is the nidobux layer. Importantly, as you can see, in a normally implanted placenta, the cytotrophoblast and cystitotrophoblast implant only down as far as nidobux layer. This allows for normal cleavage and removal of the placenta at time of delivery. Certain conditions can cause nidobux layer to be lost. The most common is cesarean delivery. Anything that interrupts the endometrium, such as myomectomy, DNC, or previous pregnancies can also disrupt nidobux layer in certain parts of the endometrium. When the placenta implants through nidobux layer and into the spongiosum, it becomes difficult to remove. This is called a placenta accreta. When the placenta implants even further into the myometrium of the uterus, as can be seen in this slide, this is called a placenta increta. These placentas cannot be removed whole and often cause hemorrhage and almost always require hysterectomy. Even more pronounced is placenta percreta, where parts of the placenta grow through not only nidobux layer, the decidua spongiosum, and the myometrium, but also grow all the way through the peritoneum and can begin to invade in nearby organs. This again is a very dangerous situation and is associated with postpartum hemorrhage and need for urgent hysterectomy. All right, now that we have a better understanding of the basic science pathophysiologic processes that occur for abnormal placentation, let's review the management plan for our patient DD. Even though DD's vaginal bleeding has improved, she will probably be admitted to the hospital for some amount of time of observation. During this observation, there will be continuous fetal monitoring and she will have daily non-stress testing. Since there is an increased risk of preterm birth, she will be provided intramuscular corticosteroids for fetal lung maturity. With her bleeding placenta previa, she is at risk for acute hemorrhage. In this setting, you would want to provide your patient with two large bore IV sites and make sure they're both working. As mentioned earlier, an active type and screen would be sent down to the blood bank. This needs to be replaced every 72 hours in most institutions. Since she is RH negative, she will need a Rogam injection. Normally, these patients are observed for any further bleeding. If she goes some amount of time without having any further bleeding, say anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, she could be discharged to home and monitored as an outpatient. If she has a second round of bleeding, she will usually be admitted back into the hospital for a longer duration of time. The obstetrical team must balance ongoing bleeding, fetal and maternal distress with prematurity of the fetus in deciding when to perform a delivery. In our institution, patients are often delivered for their third bleed if they have heavy bleeding or once they reach approximately 34 weeks gestational age with a complete previa. All right, everybody, that's about going to do it. Let's review our goals and objectives and see how we did. Discuss the workup and management of a patient presenting with placenta previa. Review prenatal care or screening options. Discuss venous stasis in pregnancy. And describe in detail the basic science pathophysiology of placenta accreta, increta, and percreta. All right, everybody, I think we did it. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. Good luck with your studies, and we'll see you around, everybody. Bye-bye.